Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, a member of Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, and I work with ICAD uh, USA. Sandra Tamari is a Palestinian organizer and executive director of the Adala Justice Project. She's a co-founder of the St. Louis Palestine Solidarity Committee and was co-chair of the steering committee for the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. She was Palestinian liaison with the St. Louis Black community in 2014 when Michael Brown was murdered in, in uh, 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 Ferguson, Missouri. Adala Justice Project is a Palestinian-led organ organization that works to achieve collective liberation by creating and nurturing intersectional relationships among liberation movements. And we'll learn more about those things as the interview progresses. Sandra, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. Um, let's get right to it. Uh, as we mentioned, this month is the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, uh, Sarah, uh, Sandra. As, uh, as a Palestinian woman, when you hear the word Nakba, what kinds of images, emotions, what kinds of memories does it elicit in you? Well, yes, I've been thinking a lot about my about this yeah anniversary 75 years is you know a lifetime uh, and it was a lifetime for my father-in-law Elias who left uh, Jaffa left Jaffa in April of 1948 um, he would have been 100 100 this year 101 in July and so he was a young person when the Nakba happened, um, but an adult and remembers, you know, it was his life. And so I think a lot about, you know, the fear that his, you know, family had, the decision, the hard decision they had to make to leave the home. Um, the, his mother did not want to leave. This is what we understand from the stories we collected. His mother was the one who said, if we leave, we may never go, come back. And it was, uh, it was a cousin who said, if you don't leave, your, your sons may not make it. Uh, it was that kind of decision that she had to make, like to leave the home and to make sure that her, her, her children would be, would be okay. And, you know, but it, it didn't come, you know, that decision didn't save them all because, um, Elias's father died soon after and you know he they they ended up in Ramallah because they had friends there they had family already settled in Ramallah and you know within months uh Elias's father uh died of a heart attack and you know we're all you know pretty convinced that the trauma of losing his home losing his business uh losing his land was part of it so you know 1948 was a year of you know collective tragedy, but also you know personal tragedy uh, for our family. So yeah, so I think I'm thinking about all the people who experienced that trauma, right, in very personal ways. Um, because yeah, we don't talk about that much. We don't talk about the ways that you know individual families were torn apart how families, you know, suffered so, so much emotional damage um, and, and physical damage because of the Nakwa. So, but thank you for asking. Well, I do because, you know, um, words are symbols, uh, headlines, uh, titles of webinars and interviews, but we're dealing with um, real people, real, real feelings, real families, you know, human beings that have, where there's been an assault on their livelihoods, on uh, their personhoods, on their very existence, and not only as individuals, but as a people. And so I appreciate your personal sharing of at least part of, part of your story. Um, the other half, Nakba at 75 is the title of our series, but then 
the ongoing Nakba uh, is what we want to talk about too. And that'll, that'll kind of cast a shadow over this entire conversation we're going to have. Two days ago, uh, political prisoner Khadr Adnan died in his cell after 86 days on a hunger strike. So as terrible as an event as that is uh, for his uh, children, his family, use that as a window, if you would, uh, to say a word about the ongoing Nakba. Yeah, I think we're all feeling so demoralized about Padre Adnan's death. This was not his first hunger strike. This is, you know, he was jailed maybe 10 times and this is his fifth hun hunger strike. And the hunger strike he undertook in 2012, I think garnered, garnered a lot of attention and a lot of international solidarity. This one, not so much. And I think a lot, a lot of people that I talk to now in Palestine are feeling very guilty about that. And the, the fact that the Israeli regime allowed him to die. Um, there, there had always been an intervention, a medical intervention, a way, you know, a, something that, you know, got him out in time to save his health and, and, and bring him back to his family. I think this is the regime we're dealing with, right? This, this Israeli regime has a very different attitude, right, about Palestinian prisoners and about Palestinian life in general. Um, so I think that we're in a moment, right, where a lot of Palestinians are feeling very um, helpless and demoralized about the wave of violence that we're facing, the um, ongoing land confiscations, the continuing siege of, of Gaza. Um, you know, it's every day. Every day is a new martyr. Every day is a new face or three or four or five. And I think, you know, all of us are becoming, um, I don't know, there's a, there's a sadness, right, among us, because you don't have a moment to mourn, like we haven't even had a chance to mourn what happened 75 years ago. <laughs> um, how do we mourn what happened yesterday or the day before yesterday, before, because today we're, we're facing a new onslaught of some sort, and we're all, you know, bracing, bracing for May to be another very violent month, already Gaza has been attacked once. <laughs> Um, and so we know, we know that these things are, are hanging over us. And so I just, I don't know, I don't know if I've answered your question, but the ongoing Nakwa has created a lot of uh, demoralization, has created a lot of anger. And so it, it explains a lot about the reaction that's happening in Palestine, obviously, you know, the, the increased uh, confrontations that are happening, because the reality is that there's no separation that, you know, more and more land has been confiscated and settlers are everywhere. They walk around the streets of the West Bank, they walk around East Jerusalem, and they, they act very entitled and very, you know, they, they own it in their minds. And, you know, so the confrontations are inevitable. And so I think that's the place we're at, is that it's, we're at a new breaking point. So I, I don't know, you know, 75 years is way too long. Uh, so like, where, where do we go from here? I think is the question. You know, there's, uh, there's the imprisonment, there's the killings, there's the house demolitions and, and all the rest. And there's also, I mean, I talked to my Palestinian friends and, and I, you know, I get there about once a year now for the last 25 years. And, um, they talk about PTSD, but not as post-traumatic stress, but present <laughs> traumatic stress disorder. In other words, it never ends. There's no post about it. And you know that I've read uh, and shared with some of the folks here, a, a book called The Body Keeps the Score, meaning that trauma Im Im embeds itself in the very biological struct physical structure of the human being unto generations and so say a word say a word about just the trauma and the stress not just the the other as as, as horrific as that is yeah i mean i've learned about this idea of the, of the trauma in the body uh from indigenous or organizers here in the u.s um i was in new mexico for a gathering 
And we did an exercise where you, you know, you laid on the floor and you drew an out, somebody drew an outline of your body, kind of like one of these, you know, murder scenes. But the idea was that we were supposed to reflect and read and then like write down what emotions were connected to what parts of the body. And that was a really interesting experience. Um, there's so much trauma in, in my family who wasn't even displaced in 1948. My family is from Ramallah, from the West Bank. And, you know, my grandfather was someone who was very involved in, in resistance against the British uh, colonial forces. And, you know, I think the loss of Palestine in 1948 uh, impacted him in ways that were very damaging and led him away from the family and, and it ended up uh, causing his death. So, you know, my father was nine, he had younger siblings, you know, so like my grandmother raised these kids, five of them uh, without her husband. And, you know, like that trauma lasted forever, you know, and thinking about like when my grandmother was 91 and, and you know, beginning to have some dementia, you know, she was worried about my kids. She was worried that my kids didn't have enough to eat, which was, you know, far from the truth. But her, the trauma of being like what she, like she was thinking about when she, her kids were young, like, did they have enough to eat? Was she able to feed them? And, I, and so I think about that a lot, like what, you know, her trauma never ended and it came up in strange ways, right? And um, and how she interacted with us. And she was, she was always worried. So like this was an underlying, um, manifestation, right, of, of the Nakwa, even though she didn't lose her home in 1948, she lost her husband and, and, and things, you know, did, did change dramatically because of it. We talked about Khadr uh, Annan. Uh, next Thursday, May 11th, will be the one year anniversary of the murder of Shireen Abu Akhle. Uh, in, in addition to bombings and regular killings of Palestinians, you said every day another one, two, three, or more killed. There's also an assault on Palestinian cultural leaders, leaders in the arts, and more to the point on the Palestinian press and even the foreign press. Uh, talk to us about that. Did you well, know Shireen by any chance? Did I did not know Shireen. I, I did not have the honor of meeting Shireen. Um, and I know it's hard to believe that it's been a year since no, that I'm terrible not. incidents. Um, Incredible. I mean, her death was shocking, obviously. And I think the attack on her funeral was shocking. And I think that it just shows that there's no limit, right, to the what the Israeli regime will do to erase Palestinian life. There was no, they didn't have any problem with the fact that she was international press. They didn't have any problem with the fact that she was an American citizen. They didn't have any problem with the fact that she was unarmed and you know standing to the side of of what was happening. Uh, she was targeted, you know, and this is this happens over and over again. You know, the difference I think this time is that the Israelis were not able to hide behind this lie that they often say, you know, that they always say that you know this was a terrorist. This you know this was to protect Israeli security. Um, I think more and more people are understanding that 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 is a you know a subterfuge that has to be dismantled, that this Israeli regime does not have any limits on, on the erasure of Palestinian life. Um, cultural institutions in Jerusalem have been shuttered. Um, there have been attacks on leading, you know, Palestinian human rights organizations. You know, the, the attacks, you know, on the NGO6 were so absurd, right? They not only, you know, uh, declared them terrorist organizations, but literally soldered the doors with iron, you know, to make sure that people couldn't go back in and were, you know, threatening people with punishment. I mean, these are all the very symbolic and, and visible ways that Palestinian life is being, being crushed, but it's the everyday things, you know, people just can't travel. They can't get to um, cultural activities. Um, when I was in Palestine, most recently, people in uh, a village just north of Ramallah were getting together in an, in an area in considered Area C because they were trying to reclaim their land. They called the festival the, the festival of forbidden life. The idea was that, you know, 
we were forbidden from being here, but we're going to celebrate. And it was a really beautiful intergenerational um, gathering where the kids were brought in and there were donkey fashion shows and there was Depke and there were songs. And um, I think that these kinds of things are ways of like resisting, but these are very hard because it was for me with someone with an American passport, it's a remote area. It's difficult to get to, you know, all of these kinds of like celebrations of life, you know, require time. <laughs> and with the economy, people don't have that kind of time and they require money because you have to have transportation to get to these places. Um, so I think that life is getting smaller and smaller for people, unfortunately, and our, and our ability to think collectively and to act collectively is shrinking. You know, our, <clears throat> This summer will be this June will be my 16th solidarity tour. I uh, in the past we visited Defense for Children International uh, Palestine Al Haq. This summer we'll visit with uh, Sahar Francis at um, Adamir, and uh, I saw Hagai and Sahar this past November when I was there. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the 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 forbidden six and John Kleinhexel asked the question uh are are they closed uh, tell us a little bit more about their status today and are they still functioning talk to us about that yeah i mean the organizations continue to function i think the the fact that the european union came out very strongly and said we have no evidence that the israeli charges are legitimate uh, was a, was really important because that meant that uh, EU funding continued to go to many of those organizations. The reality is that the the work is very difficult. So some organizations are better suited or better suit yeah better suited to to survive this kind of challenge. I think an organization like Edimir that you mentioned with Sahar, um, I think they're facing huge um, obstacles in their work. Um, first of all, they're trying to support prisoners and prisoner families. There are over 5,000 Palestinians that are being detained, um, political prisoners, many in administrative detention. Um, the need is huge, right? And so one organization is not <laughs> adequate. And one organization with a diminishing staff and a diminishing budget, because it's very difficult to get uh, support to uh, Edimir uh, because of all kinds of laws in the US. Um, I think, you know, the, their future is is precarious, and we don't know if it'll continue. Um, organizations that are, uh, like Al Haq, I think, that have more, you know, government grants are going to be be okay in the long run. Um, but I'm less concerned about research, like Al Haq does, and I'm more concerned about direct services, like Edimir. And I think this is where, yeah, you know, we need to figure out like how can we be a little bit more creative in in supporting the work on the ground. You wrote this for the War Resisters League, and I'm going to read this to you, okay, and then have you respond. Palestinians are among those uniquely positioned and, and uniquely positioned to build powerful domestic alliances against settler colonial violence because of a simple truth. Both the United States and Israel are settler colonial projects. Both countries use the language of democracy to build an image of being beacons of justice and human rights, when in reality, the ideology of both countries originate from violently oppressive ideas of supremacy, where some people have more humanity and rights than others. Settler colonial ambitions require violence against and the erasure of indigenous people. Yeah, well, thanks for that reminder. I, I, I still <laughs> That's believe pretty powerful. that. I gotta just tell you, that that's worth our folks coming on the call today just to hear that. That's nice of you. Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, I think the you know as I learn more about as I learn more about Zionism and I learn more about uh, the foundations of the U.S., you realize that so much of the language ideology that inspired Zionism comes directly out of the U.S. playbook, right? Um, it's the same playbook that inspired Nazism, to be quite frank. You know, it's, um, you know, the U.S. set the set the way. Um, and there's a great book by Mahmoud Mamdani um, that talks about, you know, settler colonialism and has all these case studies. And when you read the U.S. section, 
you you hear you know things about you know biblical prophecies that promise the land to the Europeans and um, about you know the the less than human nature of the native people and you're like well yeah we understand we know we Palestinians recognize that this is exactly Zionist you know ideologies that they are entitled to the land it was given to them by God Palestinians are less than um, you know it is the U.S. that inspired these kinds of things and paved the way for Israeli settler colonialism. It's not just a modern day alliance, um, but it goes way back, right? Um, the, the road was set <laughs> by, by what the U.S. did to, you know, native peoples. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the Zionist, you know, that came out of Europe uh, before the founding of the state of Israel, you know, were, were inspired by British colonialism. So it was, you know, the reason that Palestine was chosen is because, you know, the British already had this idea, already had the idea that Palestine was a holy place, was the um, place that Jews needed to return to. So like it, it, all of these terrible ideas, ideologies, you know, um, came together to, you um, yeah, to choose the Palestinians for this tragedy, unfortunately. Um, but I, so I do think that we have a special role to play as Palestinians to like remind people um, that what happened, what's happening to us is not exceptional. What's happening in Israel is not exceptional. Um, that we really are um, part of a, of a history, um, unfortunately, of, of a lot of, lot of dispossession and violence that's happened across the globe throughout history and to this day. You referenced, um, you referenced the role of religion, particularly Western Christianity. Uh, most of us on the call, I think, get get the, the dangers and destructive nature and really the heretical evil of Christian Zionism. But you wanna you wanna say a word about that? Yeah, you know, I I am also Christian. I was raised Catholic. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of it's an inter it's an interesting when you um when you read the Old Testament, you know, it's it is easy to fall into these traps that somehow the modern state, settler colonial state of Israel is somehow, somehow a biblical, you know, uh, determinant or a biblical revelation happening. Um, you know, it's, it's a very uh, sad misunderstanding that many Christian Zionists have. I think maybe they're holding on to, to some kind of myth or maybe, you know, I think it's very easy, I think, for people to to fall trap, right? Because the Israelis are are very good. Zionists are very good at at this propaganda. Um, I, you know, I wish that we had more strong and robust campaigns within churches. Um, the place that I'm most concerned with is in the Black Church because I yeah. think that this is like a place where there sh there are natural affinities, and um, unfortunately, these um, these religious ideas these misinterpretations, misreadings of biblical text have uh, have created divisions that really shouldn't be there. So I, I don't know how, I don't know what else to say about that, but it is, you know, the leading cause of US support for Israel. Um, you know, increasingly, increasingly, we're seeing a, a divide among, you know, conservatives and more progressives in the US. I think that we can continue to push that divide and we're seeing openings among, you know, more liberal and moderate Israel supporters and questioning what's happening there, um, but that doesn't uh, that doesn't tear down like the alliance between uh, right wing Israel supporters and and right wing uh, Americans who tend to be very religious, very Christian. Well, and Elizabeth Myers in the chat mentioned the doctrine of discovery, and so this has a long, long, long history. Uh, within uh, Christian, the Christian church and the Christian tradition. Say more about um, in, about your quote, you know, both the United States and Israel are settler colonial projects, uh, manifest destiny. Talk about the racist foundations, really, uh, of its assault on indigenous peoples. I mean, there, it, it, it connects, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. I mean, you to be able to throw people out of their homes, push people off their land at gunpoint, um, to bomb people, to, you know, you know, you have to be able to imagine that they are not human. They are not equal. Uh, so it is a hierarchy, this hierarchy of uh, humanity, the hierarchy of, uh, you know, justice, that my people are deserving of this land. And so it is what drove, you know, a the European settlers on this land. It's what drives uh, the Israeli settlers. Uh, they believe they're entitled and nothing can get in their way. So as much land as possible with as few natives as possible. Um, yeah, it was, it was driven by manifest destiny that was inspired by papal bulls. And, you know, this is the same church that also, you know, justified slavery and justified the enslavement of, of Af you know, Africans here. So, you know, we're dealing with something that's uh, a true distortion, right? Of, of what Jesus taught, obviously. It's, um, it's a use of power that is uh, directly in contradiction to what Christianity should be. The St. Louis Palestine Solidarity Coalition is a project of the St. Louis Instead of War Coalition, uh, from what I understand. The previous quote uh, was something you wrote as part of a promotion. You've also written this, Sandra. The tactics of the US and is Israeli militaries inform one another. The United States subsidizes the Israeli military providing 3.8 billion US tax dollars every year, money that should be instead invested to uplift the safety and critical needs of our communities. We get that 3.8, I mean, that's a number we know the U.S. and Israeli military stand directly in the way of indigenous peoples in the United States and Palestinians to building fully liberated communities, which is why we must continue to resist militarism and build the better, more just world we know is possible. Yeah, you know, I think everyone on this call is, is probably familiar with uh, the deadly exchange program that was uh, campaign that was started by JVP. A lot of that work, you know, stemmed out of the work that we were doing in St. Louis, because what we saw is, um, you know, not only the establishment, Jewish uh, organizations, Zionist organizations here in St. Louis, uh, standing with the St. Louis police after the killing of Michael Brown in 2014, but actually, you know, local ADL, um, Anti-Defamation League, honoring the police department, like months and just months after the killing of Michael Brown. This city was in turmoil. This city was an uprising over that killing. And we had, uh, you know, the Zionist ADL, you know, having a banquet and honoring, you know, this institution. And it was, it was shocking to us as Palestinians, as black activists that were looking at this. And, um, you know, it, it, it got, you know, a lot of national movements thinking, like, what is this relationship between the police and Zionist organizations? And as you know, now, a lot of that has been uncovered, you know, that the ADL has trained more police officers than any other organization um, in the country, that uh, regularly uh, municipal police departments are sent to Israel for training and anti-terrorism, um, you know, tactics. And, you know, the most latest iteration is that we, we're seeing in, in Atlanta, um, the protest against Cop City, this huge urban warfare uh, facility that's being built in the middle of the city uh, to take down, you know, acres and acres of forest land in the city, um, displacing black communities. Um, $90 million is being invested in this, uh, this facility to train Atlanta police, uh, police from around the country, and then continue to train um, Israeli police and uh, other, you know, police from around the globe. Um, the city of Atlanta has been very clear. Citizens have stood up and said, we do not want this facility to be built here. We want the forest to remain. Um, a forest defender was killed by Georgia police in January. Um, so it, it's continuing to escalate. And I think very, it's very clear that activists have made the connection between Palestine and uh, and what's happening in Atlanta. I think we need to be better at like 
drawing those connections and looking very closely at the corporations that are making this possible. Like, so we've been looking very closely at, you know, not only the funders of the Atlanta Police Foundation that are building this thing, but looking like trying to figure out like who's insuring this project, who's, you know, facilitating the construction of this project, who's providing, you know, the supplies for the for the general contractor, and really trying to think about like what what are the possibilities for BDS campaigns that link uh, cause. So we we've established a narrative, but then can we really go after some of these companies together uh, with black communities and indigenous communities in Atlanta, within, with forest defenders, with climate justice people that are all looking very closely at this, at this site. That's going to be, you know, unfortunately a place where, you know, our killers are trained. Words have power uh, and, and framing is critical in our analysis of what's happening in Palestine. So, uh, uh, as you wrote and just discussed, uh, um, and uh, uh, as we've seen, I mean, just in the 20 years, 20 plus years I've been involved in, in the struggle, we've gone from conflict to occupation to apartheid and settler colonialism. So this evolution of the framing, it, and it's not just framing, it's the reality. I mean, it, it, so I don't want to, it's not just PR, right? It's, it's, it's truth. It's the reality. Why is it important for activists not to be tame? I mean, we not to be tame in our description of what's happening. I mean, people are paying prices here with loss of jobs and, and shunning and all the rest, but our Palestinian friends are losing homes and family members and lives and all the rest. And so I've, I noticed a certain timidity when I first became involved because of personal costs. But you know, the more I'm involved and the older I get and the more I know my friends and their stories, I guess I'm just throwing timidity to the wind. And I want you to say a word about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really worried about people that are active. I think the ones that are silent are the ones that I'm worried about more. Um, I've just seen too much um, fear about even beginning to speak. So like, I'm okay with timidity. At least you're trying, you're there, right? You're, you're, you're learning as you go. And I think, I, <laughs> I think that comes with time, right? It comes with time. I'm, more, I'm much more concerned with the ones that are bystanders, right? Who see it, who even travel, even people that go on sometimes on delegations and then come back and are not engaged don't even talk to their friends about it. Like that is very <laughs> concerning to me. Like I have a lot of mixed feelings about delegations uh, to Palestine. I just don't know, like there's a lot of investment. It's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of time. And Palestinians are very patient and they'll tell their story over and over again to many groups that come through. Um, but people come back and I don't know that they know exactly how to plug in, what to do. And so I think sometimes they feel overwhelmed and and end up not doing things. And so, yeah, I don't know. I think that's a bigger problem. Um, the timidity, I think, goes away with practice. And I know that, yeah, no one, no one is born an activist. Nobody is born with all the knowledge. So I think that, yeah, the effort is, is appreciated. Apartheid language is becoming more and more now uh, uh, present. Uh, not only in kind of certain leftist activist Palestinian circles, but now more mainstream. Uh, Yeshdeen, Betselem, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Christian denominations in the U.S. and I mean the U.N. Uh, universities and others. Apartheid language, using apartheid to describe what's happening, is critically important, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's an important framework, and obviously, it has power beyond the legal definition. It does have power because of the South Africa example. I think people understand that you know the treatment of different people based on their ethnicity, their religion is is unacceptable. I think you know. Human Rights Watch did, I think, a pretty good job of laying this out and, and kind of explaining that apartheid was part of a larger system. 
I think the amnesty report came up a little short in that it didn't acknowledge that apartheid was serving a settler colonial project. Um, so I think that we have to do a little bit more education. I think that apartheid is like, yeah, it's an important framework and I think that we will keep pushing it. Um, but it's not the entire story, obviously. It doesn't you know, specifically tell people like, why? Why are they doing this? What is? What are the ramifications? Um, I think it takes a little bit more time for people to understand in service of what? What is Israel trying to do through this system? Um, and then it's it, it shouldn't be, you know, I think we'll get there. I think people will start to get it, that this is a land grab. This is a, an annihilation of a people rather than just different laws for different people, different treatments. But you we know, have a ways to go. You were anticipating my next uh, question because as important as apartheid language is, it really, and it is, but it's apartheid toward an end, which is, and you know, I'll talk to folks here when I give presentation about settler colonial, you know, agenda. Well, eyes kind of glaze over because that's just so much jargon. They get apartheid, They're, they wake up when I say apartheid. So we have to do, as you pointed out, we have to do kind of a better job of describing what does settler colonialism looks like? Look like well, of course we can look at our own country, but but and with the indigenous peoples here, but we but that edu that's that's the next step I think, uh, apartheid toward one end, and what what is settler colonialism all about? Agree? Yeah. No, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's you know settler the settler regime wants to control the land, and that means you know displacing or eliminating the people. So it is about erasure. And that's why, you know, cultural institutions, why human rights organizations, why journalists are, are, are targeted. Um, it's why, you know, that settler arm doesn't stop within the borders of Palestine. It's why spokespeople here in the US, academics, journalists in the US that speak this truth are targeted. You know, there's, you know, I think that there's maybe this uh, false idea that somehow the Israeli regime is limited to within, you know, the the land that it that it occupies or controls, and that's not the case. You know, because of its alliance with global movements, with global authoritarians, <laughs> and, and terrible regimes across the globe, you know, they have a lot of control in different places because it it meshes like their their agendas overlap, right, with the U.S. regime, with the British regime. Um, so they have they have a lot of power. You know they are they are definitely about control and about limiting discourse. I want I want you to say a few words about Adala Justice Project. One of the things most impressive I think about Adala, uh, Sandra, and your own solidarity work is building intersectional bridges with other liberation movements. And so I'm going to ask you uh, one by one about some of your intersectional work with various communities and the bridges you're building with the Palestinian liberation struggle. So let's go one by one here, okay? So since the murder of Mike Brown, and, and I'm sure before, uh, in August 2014, you focused uh, your work on building joint liberation efforts between Palestinians and Black Americans. Talk to us about one the Palestinian presence in the Michael Brown protests, and uh, uh, two, how this powerful relationship has continued during the last 10 years. Yeah. So Michael Brown was killed in August of 2014. And that was the same summer, as many of you recall, when Gaza was attacked over 2,000 civilians were killed by Israel, a terrible, terrible summer of violence. It was that same summer that um, the young Jerusalem teenager was kidnapped from his porch and then uh, burned alive by settlers. It, you know, these, um, that was a summer of a lot of sadness and heaviness. When we, when we here in St. Louis learned about Mike, death, Mike's death, um, and how we learned, you know, on a, a Saturday morning is a hot day, August in St. Louis is hot. Um, we just knew that there was someone on the streets in Ferguson who 
was dead and bleeding out and his mother was not allowed to reach him. And, and that was the story that we heard and that was what moved us. So, you know, within days we were, you know, as a community, we went out to Ferguson to stand in solidarity with the community. And we took a very simple sign, um, a banner that read, Palestine loves Ferguson. Okay. And we, a lot of people approached us and gave us hugs and said, we didn't think that anyone was listening. We didn't think anyone would be here for us. And it was a very simple, you know, showing up a very simple sign of a solidarity and love. And it was reciprocated in such a beautiful way that we, we never left. So, you know, I think, you know, you all know this from being in Palestine, how if you've ever been, you know the love and the appreciation you've received for showing up. And I think that, you know, we have to apply that to other movements. And that's, that's the way we think about our work at Adala Justice Project in that, you know, we can't expect that people are constantly <laughs> showing up for us. We also have to be there when people are, are mourning, when people are, are in crisis. And, and those relationships that we built over that period of time um, and then into the George Floyd moment have continued, right? And so a lot of those people that came out out of these protests are now the leaders of national organizations like the Movement for Black Lives. Um, so these are our friends. These are people we've been struggling with for a long time. Um, these are people like Cori Bush, who became, you know, our representative here in St. Louis. You know, we met her because she was involved in Ferguson. She was on the street and, you know, she's our friend. You know, we were, we were together. So a lot of this, you know, carries on, right? It makes our work stronger to this day. And then, you know, I'll just give one example of how our allegiance or how our partnership with M4BL, like, mm -hmm. turned something into a, a big win for our movement and that, for, for almost a decade, as you all recall, you know, this group in Vermont was, uh, was you know, uh, doing a campaign against Ben and Jerry's to try to get them to pull their business out of the settlements. It was a great campaign. It was sustained. It was going on. Um, but Ben and Jerry's wasn't budging. And it wasn't until 2020, after the uprisings uh, against George Floyd's killing, that uh, ben and Jerry's wanted to partner with the Movement for Black Lives, and they wanted to do racial justice organizing and so on and so forth. The Movement for Black Lives said, okay, we'll get back to you. They called us up and they said, hey, we know that Ben and Jerry's is on the BDS list. <laughs> what do you want us to tell them? We don't need them. We don't need this partnership with them. We're going to be fine with or without this partnership, but if we have a point of leverage, we want to use it. And they were they were able to leverage that you know that desire that Ben and Jerry's had to be on the side of racial justice and that at that point um, to push Ben and Jerry's to finally make that final decision to pull their product out of the West Bank. So it's it's just a powerful moment where it doesn't take much effort because you already have the relationships, and I think. That's our goal. Like you just keep talking to people, you keep building solidarity, keep being in their corner. You're just basically a friend to them. And then when we are in need, they're they're there for us. You um, tell us more about your and Adala's work with Red Nation. Yeah. So I've I've been, had the honor of going to be. Um, in New Mexico, in Navajo Nation, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, just to get to know people. And so Red Nation is an amazing uh, organization of Native folks, not limited to Navajo. I think they have chapters in different parts of the country now. Um, and they're really, you know, bringing um, Indigenous people together to think about their own sovereignty and their own identities, but also think globally about, um, U.S. imperialism, how it how it applies in different, you know, places, not only against native nations here on this land, but you know, extends beyond. Um, so Palestine has been an issue for them for a long time, and uh, they have put out amazing analysis and done a lot of public education, and we have been there for them. Uh, we've we've spoken at their native uh, liberation conference a few years going now. Um, 
And that, you know, now we've expanded beyond Red Nation, very close partners with Honor the Earth and with Indian uh, Collective. And just, you know, all of these organizations, you know, don't need a lot of education. They understand these issues in inherently. And, um, you know, these are what I think some of the delegations that are pointed and really do try to bring native uh, organizers to Palestine where you really do establish strong ties. And that, that's been an important part of the, of the campaign. I'm gonna betray my ignorance a little bit here, Sandra, but uh, it, is Nick Estes part of uh, uh, Red Nation or is that another, do you know Nick Estes? And he, he's somebody I've been kind of getting to learn about. Uh, I don't know him, but say a word. Yeah, Nick Estes is one of the founders of Red Nation. Gotcha. Um, okay. Uh, is uh, Lakota, uh, comes from a little bit north of, of New Mexico, but was uh, was someone who was based in, in Albuquerque, um, teaching at the University of New Mexico. And he and his partner uh, were strong mentors to a lot of young people, so really important people. Um, he's the author of a really beautiful book called Our our past is our future, I believe is the name of the book, um, which really is a, a thinking about like all of the, the ways that the past informs the present, <laughs> obviously, but also just a reimagining. It's kind of a, like the way that um, Afrofuturism, you know, created a new reality. It's, it's kind of an indigenous uh, futurism and thinking about um, new realities for, for native folks. And, and yeah, he's, he's a scholar I really admire and, and like a lot. We've hosted here in Fort Wayne, uh, Indiana, Susan Abohawa, and just a couple of years ago, right when she announced uh, for Congress, Huweda Arif, um, um, and others, talk about the, the Palestinian uh, um, feminist collective. Yeah, so uh, the Palestinian Feminist Collective is a fairly new formation, maybe two years old at this point. Um, sort of rose up uh, very soon after the May 2021 um, uprisings in Palestine. Um, in response to Palestinian feminist movements in Palestine, I don't know if you remember, but there was an amazing uh, group of women um, across Palestine that came together under the title Talat. Talat means coming out. Um, and they were, they were doing, um, demonstrations you know, in Ramallah, Bethlehem, uh, Haifa, and many parts of Palestine um, in, in response to the, a really brutal killing of a young woman uh, in Bethlehem. Um, Isra Gareyeb is her name. Um, she, was, she was attacked by her family um, for, for showing up in public. Um, it was a, a killing that was uh, really brutal. Uh, at first, they denied the killing, and then they um, there were some audio uh, recordings at the hospital that were released that proved that it was her family that were were attacking her in the hospital room. Um, so yeah, it was a shock um, to women across Palestine and in the diaspora. So the Talat movement came out, and they were really putting out strong uh, messaging and and really like making themselves very visible. And so the Palestinian Feminist Collective was in response, like saying, we here in the diaspora stand with you. Um, and so the, the organization is, uh, is large and uh, communal and really trying to assert, you know, this, um, this, this idea that there's no free Palestine without, without free women. Like what's the point of a free state if uh, we get to a point where there's still oppression there's still oppression of you know the majority of the population. So um, we we work hand in hand for national liberation and for for uh, liberation of all, of women. I've often um, considered Congress as occupied territory, and so I never paid much attention, to be honest with you. My, you know, you got X amount of time, energy, resources, but you know, in the last decade, right? I, I mean, there's there's fruit to be born in Congress, and we're seeing it more and more and more. And, you know, maybe I was wrong all those years. Uh, you mentioned Cori Bush, there's Betty McCollum, uh, 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 Rashida Tlaib, and, and, and a host of others, right? 
On the other hand, uh, there's Mr. Meeks, you know, uh, the, uh, the minority leader, you know, um, uh, bowing at the altar of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in, in uh, uh, Israel. Talk to us about Congress and advocacy and your own work. I'm in Indiana. Oh, my God, you know. Uh, uh, so, I mean, just talk to us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of just some of those advances that are being made in Congress, particularly. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting about um, about the squad in particular is that the, you know the, all of those people were elected in the after Trump was elected as president, and they were coming up out of movement. You know, they had strong support. They were they were definitely like coming, you know, they were definitely riding against this wave, this conservative wave in America. And they were elected by people who were progressive and radical and, and expect them to be progressive and radical. And I think the most important thing about their presence in Congress is that they have their community. The community is behind them because they've been reelected. You know, all of them have been reelected, have not, you know, lost their seats. Uh, so I think that's the most important thing. You know, they they represent not just themselves or not individuals. It's not like we're talking when we get those, you know, five, six, 12 people that sign on to these pieces of legislation. It's not just those individuals. I mean, we, what we're seeing is that they have the their communities behind them. So I think we're we're seeing shifts in the in the populace. And we see that happening, too, when you see like the latest you know, Pew polls that talk about, you know, Democrats, majority of Democrats support BDS, majority of young Democrats, you know, are more sympathetic with Palestinians than they are with Israelis for the first time. I think that's what's exciting about it. So like, you know, we, I think, you know, our movement's job is to continue to push these lawmakers to take, you know, more advanced stances to, you know, come out with stronger language, you know, to, bring more of their colleagues along and to teach them that this is not political suicide. You can do this without losing your constituents. And actually, you know, to show, to say to their colleagues, actually your constituents are here. They're already here. Like you're the ones that are out of step. So I think, you know, we continue to do that. It's not the main focus of our work, but I think that it's, it's, a, it's an arena we shouldn't ignore because if the point of our job, if the point of our movement is to end U.S. military support to Israel, we have to we have to contend with legislation. We have to contend with Congress. I was told by a Palestinian who's active in in political lobbying once that we we as a movement need to give our representatives permission to do what they know is right, but they're afraid to do. Would you agree with that, or is, is are we still bucking too much? Uh, is he being too optimistic or too pessimistic? I mean, I think they know. I think I don't think there's any member of Congress who doesn't know the reality of what's happening, even the Republicans. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the information is available. It's very uh, it's written. Um, there's no lack of information. So, I think we just have to create the political. Um, conditions that a lot that make it so impossible make it impossible for them to deny it yeah so it's a little bit more than one person's decision it really is about organizing at the grassroots so that they they know that they are on the wrong side if they continue to vote the way they do how can we move i mean some you know i've been involved and many of the folks on on the call are involved with organizations maybe more than one Organizations, right, have a life that education to advocacy to solidarity. But the more I do this, the more I the more I just know, as you just pointed out, we need to build a political movement with a political strategy. And uh, where's that happening? Where's that happening for us? I mean, uh, I know JVP Action. That's moving toward that. The U.S. campaign, sort of there, but I mean, I, I keep looking for for that kind of political movement with a political strategy. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think we should dismiss. You know, certainly um, 
JVP and USCPR are important organizations who are doing some really important grassroots uh, work. It's, uh, I think we're all feeling a little bit, uh, you know, tired in this uh, pandemic era, post-pandemic era, however you want to describe it. Um, so we we're out of the practice of like taking to the streets um, and, and doing the work on the ground. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, as we begin to venture out a little bit more, that we're gonna see more action, um, more campaigns. Um, I'm really hoping that nationally we can begin to think about like municipal campaigns again, because I think those are very powerful where we go and start talking to local lawmakers because they don't have the same, you know, funding interests that some of our federal <laughs> lawmakers have. Um, you know, to think about like, there's so many questions like the Israeli economy is in shambles because of this government. Um, you know, divestment is happening with or without our movement. Like, what can we do to amplify that divestment? Can we be demanding that municipalities, for instance, are divesting from Israeli bonds? That's those bonds have been, you know, the ratings have declined recently um, because of the volatility within the, you know, the the state and you know the the fear that the court system is going to, you know, end up in the hands of some of these conservatives, you know, so business interests are, are, are very worried and, you know, millions and millions of dollars, especially tech dollars are leaving Israel. So how can we like help that, <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about like, you know, some of that political strategy, I think will be coming in, in the coming period as we begin to think about like, how do we take advantage of uh, the turmoil within Israel now? Where's that happen? Do you know of places where that's happened here in the U.S. or in in, uh, in Palestine? Divestment? No, I mean this political kind of. Oh, strategy. Yeah. Yeah, we always have strategy. I think it's just a matter <laughs> of like scale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. there's always there's always strategy. There's always talk <laughs> of strategy in Palestine. Yeah, I mean it's a very different context. Um, sure. But yeah, here. You know, I don't take it lightly that you don't see it. I, I think that we do we do need to do better. We need to, um, you know, come up with some, you know, really strong national campaigns that kind of capture some of the energy, um, you know, and newly, you know, newly radicalized people coming into our movement. We need to be able to give them something to do. Um, and And yeah, we're a small organization. We're four people now. We were two until a year ago. Um, I... I would love to play that role. You know, we just have to like continue to build out and like, you know, um, we hope that we can create more campaigns where people can really take action. I know Fosn and some others have this apartheid free churches, apartheid free religious organizations kind of campaign uh, happening as we speak. So I wanna give a shout out to that. Uh, so important. So let me ask you this. Um, Ending the occupation, that's that's been, you know, that's been the goal kind of stated. What happens, this is going to be a strange question, maybe, what happens if we win? I mean, of, and I say this in, with, in the background, it's imperative that Palestinians in Palestine inform, inform our answer to that question. So that's there. But knowing that the two-state solution, if it ever was tenable, has been long, long, long uh, dead. There are many conf uh, configurations being touted, confederations, various one-state forms. Do you have a Do you have a particular opinion, or uh, 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 what are your thoughts for us American activists? What What's the end game, uh, uh, as you see it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that there's an end game beyond freedom. I think that it has to be centered on, you know, can we dismantle this apartheid settler colonial regime and then create something new, entirely new? It has to be. Um, it can't be a continuation of the old. Uh, and that's what's so hard about this because there's so many people that benefit um, and take privilege, right, in the system. So I don't, I don't see it as like some reform of the current system. I don't see it as like, oh, you know, these people are given a few more rights and then everything is fine. I mean, it really is like a, a, a rebuilding. And so I think it, it requires us to 
have that hopeful, futuristic um, kind of mentality that Afrofuturists have and um, what Nick Estes is talking about, that we really have, um, yeah, just a new, we, we, we think outside of uh, what the boxes, uh, yeah, maybe indicate as possible. Well, folks, uh, I want to give Sandra the last word, but before I do, I want to um, thank our uh, uh, co-sponsors again. Uh, so here they are. Whoops, let me let me get the right screen. So I want to say thank you to our co-sponsors again uh, for our series Knockbut 75. And I want to remind you that uh, you'll be able to find this interview at our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel next week. And Sandra and, co and our co-sponsors listed here will also get the link to our YouTube uh, copy of this, uh, uh, the YouTube link for this uh, interview. Also, just a reminder that uh, a week from Saturday, May the 13th, we have the continuing Nakba um, uh, with Sam Bahor and survivors from the 1948 Nakba, and that's with the Chicago Faith Coalition. You can find information and the link to these uh, on our Indiana Center for Millie's Peace Facebook page. So Sandra, uh, any closing remarks for us? I'm um, really, thank you so much for this opportunity, Michael. Thanks to everyone. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have more interaction with one another, but um, you can always write to me at Sandra at adalajusticeproject.org if you have any follow-up. And uh, tonight in New York City, we have an event. Um, it's an event about uh, these uh, charitable organizations that are... Uh, raising money for Israeli settlements. Um, it is both in person and online. I'll drop a link. Um, we'd love to have you join us. Uh, we have amazing speakers, uh, including Mohammed Al-Kurd, uh, Fedu Shadkawi from Jerusalem, and uh, Basil Adra, who is joining from Masafariata. So places that are uh, directly uh, feeling uh, the, the land confiscation and, the, and settler violence. So that's the link, and we'd love to have you join us tonight. You know, I uh, that's an important that's an important important event, and I wanted to ask you about the uh, about uh, these organizations that are raising tax free contributions in this country to support settlements and settlers uh, in uh, uh, Israel and in Palestine. Regavim, right? Uh, if I'm, I'm doing this off the top, Regavim is one of the most notorious ones, right? Yeah, Regavim is a big one. There are several that are very specific to New York. That's what this campaign will be focused on. Um, but we're hoping that New York becomes a model for other parts of the country, and we can, uh, you know, begin to do some research about what else is going on in different states. Because you know, these charitable organizations are registered um, in states. So yeah. this is going after the, you know, their 501c3 status. Um, so we're appealing to the New York State Assembly to do that. Um, but there will be other examples in other parts of the country. Yeah. You so know, we're one, of the, one of our friends, and maybe a friend of many online here, who's very involved in that in that uh, struggle in New York is Jonathan Brenneman mm -hmm. uh, from the Mennonites, uh, and. Um, so anyway, most of my education on top has come from Jonathan. So um, thank you for mentioning that event tonight in New York. My pleasure. Well, folks, thank uh, you. Sandra, uh, thank you for your gift uh, uh, of insight and passion and sharing today for your work with Adala and all the intersectional uh, relationships that you're building. And uh, please, folks, check out Adala's website. And thank you for joining us today. We hope to see you in one of our upcoming programs. Thank you, Sandra. And thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you, Michael.